a very distinguished and um, very articulate panel here with us. The subject uh, that we are going to discuss is how is technology and data innovation driving superior investment decisions? Now, uh, around me here are people who uh, sort of uh, manage a lot of money. Uh, you make uh, available the hard infrastructure, I would say, not infrastructure, but the information insights that enable the, those decisions. And what we are going to do is to get each of them to uh, give us their initial thoughts on what is that data innovation and technology that is enabling them or impacting their firms and their decision making strategies. Is it better? Is it for the good? Or are there any issues involved in that? And I'm going to go across to the entire panel one by one for their uh, views on this. We'll then try and open up uh, for a discussion within the panel. So that's, uh, that's the uh, process that we are going to follow. I'm going to uh, request um, Navneet, can I come to you first to, 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 to be the first person to bell the cat? <laughs> Navneet, over to you. Uh, thanks. So technology has always impacted. So as a kid in a school and college when I used to invest or probably trade in 80s and, and, and the 90s, I mean, all you got was like that annual report which used to come after a couple of months. I mean, after the March closing, and there was all the information that you had, and you had to wait for the next annual report, or maybe I think you used to get those capital market and the Lal Street magazine where you had few sets of data, that's all was the available. But over a period of time, then with the technology, I think the access to information improved. Uh, but today, I think the, the, the way we are leapfrogging globally across all industries, I think it's going to impact our industry as well. In last two years, the amount of data that we have generated is more than what humanity has done in, in the last probably 5,000 or 10,000 years. So that's the scale at which we are creating new data. So if anybody says that uh, will technology be, will not be as important and the business will be as useful, I think we are underestimating the impact. At the same time, if somebody says that human fund managers won't be there, machines will replace, I think that's a, that's a hype. The future of our business probably is fundamental, so we take pride, we are a hardcore fundamental research house, but I think that our, our future is fundamental, which is you know, the fundamental analysis with a quant overlay. For example, you look at a new company, and you want to look at the management, I mean, you, you form certain judgmental opinion, you form certain subjective opinion about it, but maybe a machine, a, a, you know, a pattern recognition machine can look at the last 20 year, every single speech, every single, annual report and, and every single interview that he's given and then the machine can come out with, with certain things and I always believe if, if no chess grandmaster in the world can stand in front of IBM Watson or if no tennis player can stand, table tennis player can stand in front of a robot, I think that similarly in our case I think people who don't use technology well will find it difficult to stand in front of those people who are using those technologies more efficiently. Absolutely, and uh, I think we'll, we'll pick up some of those points later, and I'll also get Pradeep uh, uh, from, for a Thomson Reuters perspective on some of these things, because you work with people across the globe in this space. But Mahesh Patil, uh, coming to you on the same subject, how has life changed for you or your company in the manner in which you make investment decisions over the last three, four, five years, because we hear all these big terms that keep getting thrown at us. Uh, what is the reality? Your opening remarks on this. Yeah, so I think data, I think in, information is available to everybody now uh, at the same time. It's the speed and this thing, how soon you're able to uh, get access to information and how soon you react. I think that can give an edge in the marketplace where we see a uh, lot of people looking at data and reacting simultaneously. Having said that, I think for us, uh, at various levels, uh, we look at uh, on the investment side where we can apply technology. Uh, one is at the research front, okay, how technology can be used for on the research analysts in terms of decision making. I think most important uh, is the basic would be like uh, there are a lot of uh, information which is residing uh, at various uh, points within the team uh, at the analyst level. Uh, then there are various different uh, platforms okay, which we use how to really create a one integrated uh, portal uh, which will uh, provide a one kind of a view for the analysts, for the fund managers uh, about all the data required say on, on a company at one touch and real time online whenever you are on the move. Okay, that's very important because fund managers are not always at their desk, mm -hmm. they are on the go and if you can provide a platform okay, which uh, internet where they can access information about a company at 
one point time, uh, which includes your internal analyst estimates, your uh, outside analyst et estimates. Uh, any news flow, any results coming immediately, it should pop up. So we are trying to create an integrated platform uh, which will help us uh, in terms of uh, more better analysis and, and much faster in terms of a response time uh, to react on a particular uh, information. Another way uh, where uh, we are using uh, technology is I would say that uh, trying to generate uh, alerts with a lot of uh, information which comes in and how to really direct relevant information to a particular analyst. So we can really uh, direct information uh, depending on uh, certain tags to relevant analysts, okay, what uh, is important to him and uh, he can get information timely and then, then react to that. And uh, yeah, I think that, that's one area. I think there are other areas where we can actually use technology even in the on the trading side, uh, more importantly on the monitoring side, I mean, uh, how to monitor uh, the, the, the performance, uh, how to uh, really look at attribution, uh, what's contributing to your fund performance on real time and able mm -hmm. to take decision based on that. Absolutely, and I think uh, I'll come back and pick up the point on technology for trading uh, subsequently, but um, coming to uh, you, Harsha, for your opening remarks on, on the same lines, over to you. Yeah, I think uh, usage of technology has changed dramatically over the years. I mean, uh, the time that we started doing equity research, here I'll be revealing my age if I start talking about <laughs> it. It was completely a stone age, uh, so as to say. Uh, we used to read uh, media reports and used to mark those on the newspapers or the magazines about the companies that we covered or the industries that we covered. And there used to be an attendant in our department who used to cut those clippings and then physically file it. And then whenever you need to revise a report, we, we used to actually go back and refer to those old physical files. So that was the kind of research that was being done. I think now it's changed dramatically, not so much in India, but at least in abroad. For example, in US, uh, there are companies such as uh, <clears throat> Orbital Insights or Planet Labs Inc. who have put satellites into orbit which take ground imagery. For example, if a retail store parking needs to be analyzed, the satellite will show you how the parking slots are in front of the retail outlet. And if you can collate that data, that gives you a heads up in terms of how that particular retail outlet is going to do over the next uh, uh, few months or few quarters. I'm sure so, they don't focus on India because all parkings are full here. <laughs> but sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> I'm sure Indian data will be completely <laughs> difficult to uh, manage. So, so I think uh, uh, clearly we have come a long way in terms of uh, usage of technology and I am sure by the time we finish our careers, I think it will be completely unrecognizable. Uh, already there is so much of investments that are going in into technology usage. So I think a lot of focus is going on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, artificial intelligence is essentially things which a human is doing today but it can be done much more efficiently through computers and computing technologies. Uh, machine learning is somewhat different, uh, which kind of analyzes what people are doing on social media, for example. So I think even in India, to an extent that technology usage is increasing, and I'm sure over the next few years it will accelerate much further. I'm going to uh, go across to Avnish for his remarks on this. Yeah, uh, so uh, definitely I think uh, past 20 years of my life I have seen, uh, like Navneet was pointing out, from paper to technology, uh, it's a sea change because what technology does, it frees the fund manager for making actually fund management decisions uh, rather than uh, looking at maybe his portfolios, how the attribution uh, or doing by, by Excel trying to manipulate data. Uh, what you now have is real-time data, real-time analysis. Uh, you don't have to bother about whether you are breaching uh, regulatory limits somewhere or there are any compliance issue because everything is real-time and uh, you can uh, do what if scenarios on your computer uh, with the data available uh, from third party vendors uh, and in fact uh, obviously the technology which is available now uh, you can have uh, all your news vendors on your mobiles on your tablets so when you are on the run also you can look at data you can watch prices you can get real time news uh, second is obviously uh, uh, i think from a fund management uh, or from a fund yeah. selling side Obviously, uh, you need to reach out to the millennials. Uh, you need to be more online because they would typically not read offline. So again, uh, all your investment uh, processes, everything has to be online in a readable manner. 
So I think that step we have to take and how to, how to present the data to the millennials and the new investors. And that is where the challenge uh, would come going forward and uh, in terms of transparency, in terms of your investment process. Uh, uh, whether you can make some part of the process automatic in terms of technology where uh, choosing a fund becomes much more easier depending on the risk profile of the investor. Pradeep, I want you to sort of um, relate to, for the benefit of the audience through maybe a couple of examples that can come to, uh, to you. Uh, where does broadly investment decision making in India uh, stand in comparison to let's say the US market or European markets in terms of the usage of technology, are we at par? Are we behind or in certain cases are we ahead of them because on, on a completely unrelated note in, uh, uh, with regard to some of the technology infrastructure that we are putting in including linkage of Aadhaar, we are perhaps leapfrogging many other advanced economies in the world but purely from an investment decision making point of view. Sure. So there are two things, two topics here that are slightly different. I think the first one we should address is the complete democratization of data. So this is the data that fund manager one has and fund manager two has is pretty similar or identical. That levels the playing field quite a bit. So my access to special knowledge or inside information really is gone away. So this is very simply, this is data that's available everywhere. Um, how do I pick it up? And by the way, there's no real advantage I'm getting by doing it by a human being. A machine can do a lot of that work, the heavy lifting that's been done, volumes of data that can be crunched and what can be delivered to you. The first question I have on that side is, is there a symmetry in that data in India? And it can vary on what it is. If it's a small cap, I think there's a lot more arbitrage opportunity. If it's the large caps, if it's maybe the one of the 250 or the largest 500 companies, chances are that data is probably transparent, probably transparent. One thing's for sure, in the US and Europe... Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, the asymmetry on the smaller caps is because uh, of what reasons? Lack of transparency in what's there in these companies. Or lack of coverage from those who... It could be that as well. Okay. So I don't have a full view of what's really sure, happening sure. Please there. Continue. Yeah. Uh, but when I go to, the, go to the larger companies, chances are it's well covered, well trodden, they're regulated. I mean, all of them are regulated, but you have a lot more transparency in what's happening there. So. Very simply, what kind of data transparency do I have and what can I, what can I do there? If you assume there is transparency for these large companies, then the next thing is what additional sources of data can I use to make judgments on this? Now, we just heard about satellite imagery on one side. Uh, there are all kinds of data that's there. So we've got companies that, for example, I'm an insurance company and what I do is sell insurance to anybody who buys a new car. Now, clearly there's a data set there that tells me how many new cars are being sold in real time because I know exactly what insurance there is. Now, that's another set of data that requires a different kind of thinking to it. Now, there you need to think about it quite differently. Is the data that I have coming in from this long enough in history that I can make a judgment call here? Is the data that I have from this particular source reliable enough? So is this a picture that was taken last month or is it a picture that's in real time? Where am I getting, it, getting from it? But most importantly, as a data provider and an analytics provider, how am I concording all of this data? So when I say concording, I don't want to go to five different sources to pick up data on Infosys. Can I just put on Infosys and say, well, based on X amount of data in transparent land, this is what it means. And here are the alternate sources that I'm finding for this particular company. And here's the other view on this. So that concording part of it as a data and analytics provider is something that we are striving to get to the market. That's a difficult challenge because some of this data doesn't conform to our usual ways of looking and thinking about data. We don't have history so, on this. So what you're saying is that because the input or raw data is not at the same level or at par with what is, for instance, available in the United States, there is a symmetry there. There is. Did I get you right? Correct. 
Uh, Navneet, is that something that you have observed too? Would you agree with this? Uh, because we see that in, for instance, the, uh, the divergence that we see in the quality of macro data, for instance, uh, and I'm not talking about China. <laughs> would, would you agree with that? But maybe going forward, and th that, that's the importance of the technology that I, I think the same set of managers will have to invest a lot more in technology that the way you analyze it and make sense of it because the the abundance of data will also create another challenge because then how do you cut the signal from the noise and then how do you make sense of that and probably you invest in, 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 in particularly in that aspect of the business and, and create another edge uh, to, to generate alpha. In India still I think the research arbitrage is still very large. The, uh, I think if you have the resources, if you have, I think a, a large part of the market is not as Organize the institutional money is not as large and probably I think for a long period of time that edge will be will be there. One of the points that's very clear from the panel is that uh, humans are not going to be replaced. Uh, maybe their roles will change and specialization and the number of people uh, in the decision making matrix may reduce. But Harsha, I wanted to come to you. you. You reminded me of how I began my career where um, uh, I, I realized after the first month of my job at Nariman Point, many, many years back, I was picking up an allergy and I realized that the newspaper cuttings for the, used to be a very dusty thing. And from there we moved to uh, the computers and the first time we installed uh, Internet Explorer, I ended up deleting it after the IT guy had installed it. So uh, you reminded me of that time. But I, I wanted to ask you, uh, Maybe not about your firm if you don't want to tell us, but from, from the amount of money that firms in India are investing on the latest data technologies, for instance, sentiment analysis, there is a company that we have also tied up which gives us that. We show it five or six, ten times during a, a trading day. Uh, are Indian companies in there in, investing enough on the right kind of technology and the latest technology? I know Pradeep uh, would also want to probably comment on that, but I'll ask you that first, Asha. I think uh, spend on technology from Indian asset management firms are still at a very nascent stage. I think uh, apart from maybe top 10 or 12 asset management companies, everybody is struggling to make money. So first let them make money and then probably spend on technology. Uh, so, so to that extent, I think uh, still uh, the investments that are going to technology or in the areas of risk management, for example, which are mostly rule-based. So any technology that you develop can set some of those rules and before giving out a particular order or before taking a position in a portfolio, a machine can check all those limits. So that, that is, I'm sure, prevalent across the board in India. Uh, many of the asset management firms, including us, we use uh, uh, software to do portfolio attribution analysis, which essentially gives you how a particular portfolio has done vis-a-vis -vis the benchmark or vis-a-vis -vis whatever other metrics that you have in terms of performance, in terms of risk, and where are the outliers, where is correlation, and, and what if analysis in case you want to change a particular stock, particular sector weightage, etc. So these are the areas where I think uh, uh, Indian asset management companies have already started to invest uh, in terms of technology usage. And what Mahesh mentioned, I think uh, most of the Indian firms have been practicing DMA for quite a number of years mm. now. So it's a straight through processing, right? Uh, the dealer, instead of actually being on the phone constantly and finding out how a particular execution is happening, he can put his trade on the uh, terminal and that's directly going into the broker terminal and then into the uh, stock exchange. And it goes through a particular algorithm that has been chosen. And in case there is an intervention required, then only the dealer is actually required to look at that. Otherwise, he can do a lot of other work. So I think it frees up a lot of time of dealers. He can uh, get more connected with the market. He can supply that information to fund managers who are really looking for that. Uh, so these are the areas in which currently the technology is being used. And also in some cases, uh, like for example, we have a fund uh, which uses both quant as well as the active fund management uh, uh, methods. So it's human plus machine. Uh, although the fund size is small today, but I think uh, we are preparing ourselves for uh, future years where people will start looking at some of those. Uh, what it essentially does is it's a kind of a screener. Uh, we have set in the rules in terms of what are the parameters to look at and within those parameters it, it throws up the likely 
uh, stocks that can come into the portfolio. So that's the first level of the quant analysis or the screener that happens. And then the actual fund manager comes in. So instead of looking at a vast investment universe, you can actually start looking at maybe 40, 50 companies and then call out maybe a few out of those and start constructing your portfolio. That, but that, hopefully, that, that's uh, quite an interesting example to show. We've been in a fund which is completely based on a quant model which was developed uh, in-house where, where a hum there, there's no intervention of a human fund manager, the machine decides. Not at all, the, the, no, the, no intervention. Of course, the, the man would have done the, <laughs> done yeah. the Set the rules. The whole set the rules, but once the rule is set, after that there is no intervention. So, so can, I, tells, can I ask you? Sorry, to, uh, uh, while you complete, um, you know how do, how would a machine or any tool for that matter factor in that X factor with regard to let's say, um, you know, when when an accounting scandal gets discovered mm -hmm. in a company five years down the line, or that feeling about questions about promoters or intentions, uh, that would tell me that you can never take out the human, right? But it, it works both ways. I mean, you also have certain biases, you have certain whatever your cognitive and behavioral biases and what machine does is takes that away. So as I mentioned earlier okay. that if it is overhyped that machines will replace fund managers, that will never happen. But blockchain, I think to me, this is one of the biggest innovation of our times. Right. And I think we only relate it to Bitcoin or something, but the future of broking, the future of stock exchanges, you go a step further, the future of clearing cooperation, they are all... Under, under threat and, and maybe at some stage uh, our business as well. So I think the, would, would we need maybe stock exchanges in the current form, clearing cooperation in the current form, the whole broking industry in the current form, I'm not sure. Yeah, and we already have a, a soon to be or, or rather already happening 22 hours exchange also. Avnish, you, you've been patiently uh, listening to us. I want to uh, come, come on this uh, one particular uh, point and this is on the HR side purely and this is a slight outlier question in terms of the people that you are hiring or the people that come up and you interview uh, what is the level of technological awareness or skill set that you would see you know I'm um, I hope nobody takes it otherwise 20 years back the thing used to be that if you are a b-commerce you stood a better chance but today an engineer as some of the largest firms in the world have shown us there are thousands of engineers who build all of this uh, is that also happening in India? Are, are, are firms hiring better people, quants so to say, uh, within them to, to, you know, in their investment departments or money departments? Definitely. I think uh, if you look at the new guys who are joining you, so they are proficient with all the Excels of the world and Microsoft Ads of the world. Uh, they are adept at getting data out of uh, Google or whatever and they know how to search for it. And I think uh, that obviously is happening with the new guys who are more technologically efficient and maybe than you also because you may know that maybe this data is available on this side or this side. This guy will know everywhere where the data is available and they can pinpoint those data because Google will throw you a lot of choices. As they say in my profession, Google is, is the best friend that any journalist had. I will uh, now uh, wrap up the discussion with, with one final comment really from uh, you, Pradeep. Uh, you mentioned uh, Europe and, uh, you know, the new regulation, the uh, MIFID regulations, if that's the right way to, which pushes for higher transparency. From a policy and a regulatory push, because many things in India sometimes require a policy push, the mention of blockchain came up and Bitcoin came up. Um, we, have, we have trading uh, of Bitcoin that has been happening for several thousand crore in India and the policy architecture is not available. Now a parliamentary panel has been s set up to go into whether it is valid or not. There is a RBI master circular which is neither here nor there. Do you see the need or a possibility for a regulatory intervention to set um, or direct uh, you know, the entire industry here in India to adopt a certain minimum benchmark of technology, minimum uh, benchmark of standards, because that is the way that I see the European instance and maybe I could be completely wrong in understanding what it is all about. I think, first of all, we have to be appreciative of where we are in India in this whole space, right? The assets under management, how long the industry has been around, how stable it is, the number of players in the space, how much money is being made. In India, we've come a long way in a very short period of time. These guys in the U.S. have been doing it for the last 50 or 60 years. You know, you still have the issue, I mean, what is the settlement time in India now? T plus one? We had T plus three in the U.S. till the last 10 years back. And yet, in India, you have T plus one on the flick of a switch, which is in par, par with all of the markets globally. 
So let's be appreciative of where, how fast things have evolved. As it relates to blockchain, and look, there are no standards there. I mean, what are the regulators trying to do? They're all trying to grapple around what is to be done. Is there something that we should be looking after? Uh, with, with, the, with new technology, can it be faster? With blockchain and settlement thing, can it be T plus one second? Because really, can you do the distributed ledger and do that there? Uh, can I use social media to gather new information? What kind of information? What is true? What is fake news? How does that work? <laughs> so we're in this very thin age now of, of saying, look, that's what's being used there, and that has more alpha in it, and that's different. But let's just be appreciative of where we are. I think before we start putting ring fences, and I think before people say you should be doing that and thou shalt not be doing that, we need to make sure the industry in its whole is healthy, the general population is protected, and we all are having a good upward spiral before we do that regulation. But that's my two cents. Well, uh, that's a good point because uh, clearly if you saw the mix of opinion and viewpoints that came from the panel, uh, it's very clear um, different market participants have a different understanding and a different sort of uh, familiarity level and investment level um, yeah, as far as this uh, subject is concerned. But the big picture really that I would want to add here is that if you look at what has probably happened in the last few months or a year or two, uh, including how uh, you see the uh, adoption of Aadhaar, if you look at the technological backbone that is being put in place, if you look at, uh, for instance, Bheem and what it can do for, you know, retail level uh, 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 banking and, and all of that which is uh, falling in place uh, at a very rapid uh, pace, I would suspect that uh, that underlying technological upsurge and change in behavior would perhaps translate uh, in, into this very higher level of investment decision making also, but um, clearly this is a subject which uh, can be debated for a uh, much longer time. Um, we are completely out of time uh, at this point. I would like to thank my entire panel here for their time and their insights on the subject and thank you very much to the audience for being such patient listeners. But that is a wrap on this. Thank you for being here. Thank you.